Well, we're here out on our 2022 Camp Kick and Bear Habitat charity event, and uh, we're getting into more of the meat and potatoes of hunting strategy and questions. And we happen to have the whole gallery here of people that are in the habitat, walk and talk, seeing certain features. One of the features I couldn't wait to show people was this giant water hole setup. This is a 300 gallon setup. I think someone might have a question on overall size too, but we have about five questions from people in the group. And what I like about that is typically where we're coming up with our videos is when you guys have comments and you on YouTube, when I'm out on client properties, I have a list of about 11 or 12 videos right here just from my last client trip in Michigan, let alone YouTube comments then what you guys are asking is what we make videos of because we'll look at it like, you know, that's a good question. I've never heard that asked that way. And you'd think that water holes, you'd have two or three videos and, and you're done, but they're all those slices of pie we're trying to hit. So you guys understand water holes more out there. So the group here understands more. And, and we've probably created 40, 50 water holes. I know even mock scrapes alone, we have over 50 mock scrape videos in a playlist. So this water hole is, they're a dynamic setup. I shot my deer. My buck in Minnesota over a water hole last year. I shot my buck in Wisconsin over a water hole last year. Some of my largest bucks have been relating to a water hole over the years. So I think it's pretty cool we have this group here. I think they're gonna ask questions that you guys wanna hear out there. And I think Gunner is gonna follow around and uh, find people with questions. So let's start out with number one. That's right here. So what's your question? In a place in the water hole, would you put it in, a, in line with a spring where there's always fresh water running in it? Or do you want a rainwater just to fill it naturally? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, so you're, you're, the question is, um, if you guys can't hear out there, just if you have a spring, are you putting a water hole in? Would you add a water hole because you have a spring? Um, or have the spring if, running into the water hole to fill it. Sure. And then let it have a constant fresh water supply or do you want it? rainwater filled. Yeah, so is it rainwater filled, spring filled? And uh, just a real quick comment, um, you're from uh, Northern Minnesota, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> With your accent. <laughs> yeah. Middle Tennessee. <laughs> Middle Tennessee. Yeah. So we have, uh, you came out for the Habitat Day from Tennessee, yeah. and then uh, I know someone came from Indiana. Um, any other long distance travelers to get to the, uh, yes, yes, Ben right there is um, from at least 35 minutes away. Yes, good job, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Winona. <laughs> Winona, yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of close ones, but I know uh, we had someone come from New Jersey last year that flew in. So we have people come from all over. I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, that being said, we have to be really careful with when you have natural water holes or water sources is they tend to be seasonal in nature, um, meaning they have a lot stronger stronger uh, flowage at sometimes. For example, springtime, a spring might be really moving a small creek or a seepage out of the the hill and not that it wouldn't offer water the entire year but instead what you're worried about is that it gets washed out so i've seen a lot of people take a tub they bury it in an area where they expect to have it filled by a spring the spring unleashes in the spring or with a fall rain and it just blows the whole water hole out whereas if it was just natural coming down it wouldn't have done that or you're taking and building uh, an area you're going down a little bit further, finding a, a flat spot, digging a depression in there so it could flow through more naturally, but it's collecting water in a spot. This is a case right here where this water hole in particular, we want to catch rainwater. And the thing about rainwater is it's not gonna blow out the water hole. And you can see the, the where we had the excavator make this, it's up a little bit too high for that. So we're having to come back. I was on my client trip when he was out here and he made it look really pretty, but we want that down about two feet because I want that to be about on level all the way around here and then we'll collect that rainwater. Collecting rainwater to me is more, uh, it's more of a slow trickle, it's more, it's natural. But at the same time, we've had times where three years in a row we didn't have to add water. Last year I added water three times just during the hunting season because it was so dry during our, our hunting season. So this is actually cut out so that we can actually back our side by side in with, with the water hole on the or water tank on the back and, and fill it up. So something very, important to consider so uh someone else with uh, another question on water holes sure when you go to fill up your water hole during the hunting season do you come at night do you come in the morning what time of day would you get out here to do that yeah that's a good question boy um i get that a lot and to me the best time to fill it is when we're not hunting that spot the next day in the next few days and so i take that into consideration 
we might be going away for a trip for a week. I might be going to see family. We might be going on a fishing trip or something. So I'll take that time before then. But we've had water that we've filled in, uh, Dylan. Yep. It was in 2016. We had one of our tubs back then. We It showed me coming in with the trailer with a water tank on it, backing up, filling, the, filling it with water. And then the next day, I think it was the next day, we had uh, about a four-year-old buck coming in. Uh, and that was, let's say, October 26th. And the cool thing about that, it was about 40 degrees, first time we ever saw that buck. And so we're filling them a lot of times in that sweet spot of what would be traditional October lull, where unless we're hunting evening food sources, we're really not hunting much at all because we're waiting for our good cruising areas or good morning stands. And, uh, and so that's something too, we might fill this water hole, but we're gonna be hunting the, the evening food plot, hunting plot um, 400 yards that way. And so we're not really spooking out this spot. So we're planning accordingly with our hunts and trying to fit it in. But bottom line is the machine, we leave the machine running. I think them hearing a machine is a lot different than hearing voices. And so we're keeping our voices low. We're coming in here, filling this and getting out of here. And if we happen to disturb something for a little while, that's better than letting it run out. Because once it runs out and they establish a pattern of use of hitting this water, and that's the reason they were coming through here for some reason. We're trying to add a lot of other reasons are here, but then it takes a while for them to get water in here and, and reestablish that pattern, two, three weeks. So I think the risk of letting it run out outweighs the risk of coming in here and spooking a deer as far as, um, you know, spooking a deer is concerned. So, yeah, sure, Ben. I, <coughs> I noticed that you have a log that's laying in there. Uh, this re this is question is kind of uh, more about water quality, I guess. Do you find that there's any difference between like muddy water or fresh water that you might have just filled it and does it matter? It seems like um, the dirtier, the stinkier, the better, unless it's something rotting and dying in it, which is why they have the, we have the critter stick in there so that any uh, small rodents that get in there can get out. If you don't do that within a month of your water hole, you will find a dead squirrel, dead chipmunk, something dead in there. And then not only is the thing dead and you feel bad, but then at the same time, you should probably take five gallon buckets of water, remove at least 90% of the water and then refill it up right away so that you can dilute that rottenness that's in there. But when it's rotting, decaying leaves, sticks, we actually add soil to the bottom. You guys can see it's kind of a muddy layer right there, but we'll add a lot more soil. Um, and with 300 gallons, this happens to be a lot larger size. Um, we can go, we can put six inches of soil on the bottom and uh, to make it taste a little bit more natural, like a mud, mud puddle. In the spring, you come in here with a garden rake, get some of the, the, the leaves out, the leaves especially, and sticks, debris. We have a spot in Coon Valley where it drops walnuts into it. So we get those walnuts out one, so it doesn't turn it blackish, ugly water. But it seems like warm and, and muddy is a lot better than uh, cold and clear. Yeah, buck stew, yeah. So talk about the contraptions and stuff. I had a friend that was talking about it. Have you experimented with any like, pumps or heat coils or anything like that or like doing solar like using trail cam so solar stuff to i haven't um i haven't done so they have some pretty cool pump setups out there and i i just i worry about it being right around here and, and actually the pumps right here yeah. um i have someone that solar powered uh adam did you tell me about that i don't know if adam's out here this adam yeah did you tell me about someone that had a a pump going to a water hole and uh someone just had a like a bird bath or something in their yard that every year they would stick a heater in the winter and bucks would come and drink and drop their sheds in their yard yeah just because it was a one water source during the winter time yeah right. um like northern minnesota we a lot of the times like your other videos you talk about the deer coming in hitting it during rut and stuff when they're working up that thirst but by the time they're doing that and rutting and stuff up there it's frozen yeah you know, the water hole you know we do a lot of work to dig them in and stuff in the back areas and then they and then during the rut they're all frozen in i would definitely try something in that case i would start freezing sometime typically in november and then they'll melt a little bit in early december and then freeze back up again yeah. um but i would say between november and december they might be available half the time um you ever, like chip them out or anything no mm -mm. you know it's interesting they'll still come for a week or two and and hit it and uh, it's establishing that pattern of use. But again, yeah, if they, if they come here a few times and it's not there, they'll, they'll find something else. But we're trying to keep it within the same movement. And it's interesting, when we have a mock scrape here, overall during the hunting season, they hit the mock scrape more than the water hole. So a lot more resources spent putting the water hole in when the mock scrape is almost more important than the water hole. 
and kind of get back to your question too about um, mock scrape distance from a water hole, as long as you can shoot to both of them, that's the main thing. We like to line them up so that we can get a, pit, a camera on this and that, because it's interesting to see how many bucks will come in the mock scrape and just come passing through and they don't even stop at the water or vice versa. They'll hit one or the other. But we've said there's a, a real premium on the mock scrapes in September, um, early to mid-October, all of December, and then in November they might switch over to where they're really end of October hitting the water hole at a higher percentage of time. I guess in conjunction with the water hole going, staying on that same topic with the mock scrape, is there a certain amount of distance that you want around the mock scrape so they can kind of work it? And yeah, this, it that's, this right here is about as close as I want to make it between these two trees. They can obviously move around quite a bit, but this is even starting to get close. I would guess this is seven, eight feet. And so it's, this is getting too close because there's not enough room to get around. And especially if this was a big shrub here with a tree and this is a big shrub here with a tree, I think it's too confining. This is right out in the open. Um, we could even do it between where Gary's at and right over here on the shag bark. That's a little bit wider space. And so then I'm determining what lines up best with uh, camera location. We had a camera location right back there, or no, it was on that, that uh, poplar right back there. It's another uh, question up here for sure. Um, last year, um, I'm over on the eastern side of Wisconsin and we had record dry year last year. Um, the property that I have typically has water on it, really a lot of water in the spring. And then we usually get a really wet fall and I'll get water. Would it make sense to put a water hole in just in case you have another really dry year or is it really not worth it? I think if it's within your movement, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, if you can see, we, we also put this water hole off to the side of the trail. I don't like, I put the mock scrape right in the middle of the trail. I put the water hole off to the side. Um, I want them hitting their head on the mock scrape when they walk through. I don't want them stepping inside the water or having to go around it every time they come in. Um, but the uh, one thing to consider is, let's say we had huge water out towards our other food plots over there. And deer were coming from this bedding area through and there's tons of water over here great place for a water hole still because they're sitting dry all day they're on the way to the food in the evening and they'll hit the water let alone if a buck's cruising through here circling back not making it all the way to the food or water over in that direction so if they're bedded dry and they're heading towards food and it's dry on the way always is a good spot for for a water hole yeah, so i hope that makes sense one question I had, I've seen some of your videos in the past where kind of the water level is low in the water hole and you see them adjusting and adjusting and trying to struggle to get down to that water. Yeah. What's a good height that you should kind of not let your water go below where they kind of really struggle to get at that water? So that's, so what we're finding with 150 gallon tanks and larger, you know, they, they'll step right in there. So we've had 150 gallons, they'll step right in and get to it. Okay. And if you have a lip like this, it's hard for them to step over and get into it. So I, I want to get that flatter down, you know, down in a flatter position. Um, but yeah, that's always a concern. We find if it's a small hole, obviously with a big buck, it's really hard to get his head down there. You know, even if that was six, seven inches from the bottom, it wouldn't, it wouldn't uh, bother me at all. Just having water there would be important. They'll get down to it. We've had them get down on their knees and they'll get down. They really, they step inside it. One thing I just remembered too, um, you can see all the soil around here, exposed soil. Obviously redoing this, so I didn't want to go buy a shady trail mix or something that we could put uh, grass seed on and clover. But I like to put green on this just to hold the soil and um, you know, avoid erosion around that water hole. And I think that's really important. So we always add that right away after it's constructed and made. And it's not for a food source, it's just to hold the soil. Also, um, when it comes to EHD, deer, deer die, they get the EHD midge. It's, that midge lives and is uh, propagated with the drying and cracking mud around a traditional water hole. With grass around here, and because the water is not coming over the top, you know, into this area, we're not going to have drying and cracking mud like a traditional water hole that's receding. So, I haven't heard of any reason that a water hole would be unsafe as it relates to deer dying or any kind of disease transmission. Um, any different than them hitting a mock scrape or hitting the same rub or eating in the same location uh, would. And to me, a tank makes a lot more sense when it comes to water holes, at least as far as it's concerned uh, spreading EHD, just because you don't have that drying, cracking, receding mud 
um, going back into this. I often point that out and I wanted to make sure that people knew that this will be seeded after this is adjusted. And uh, we'll usually use a cover crop of rye, oats. I'll actually come in here with a brush hog or mower deck and mow around this and, and mow it when it comes in, kill the rye out, oats, whatever we use for, for overseeding. So, and you can see like, we'll come in from the side here to drive in and fill this, but I hinged up there on the upper side so that when we're looking down here, I don't want deer up to my tree stand. And so I'd rather look over brush and shoot down in here and not have to worry about deer, uh, you know, walking all the way over to, to smell where I climbed up. Now we're, when we come in to climb up, we're just coming in and stepping as high as we can and reaching and we're going up because that fingerprint and that scent stays there for a very, very long time, hours and hours, um, if you're actually handling it. So we're actually not changing at the base of the tree we're not doing anything other than come in and climb up. And if we have any adjustments made to where our clothing, it's up in the stand. And we're, we're actually lifelined in before we even ever step off the ground. So I don't want to linger around there and change for five minutes. Um, that's not my style of hunting and leaving a big scent pad there that a mature buck could smell and never come back by this spot because he smelled that or never meaning for two or three months or during hunting season. Do you come in the way we came in or do you come in from above? I come in, uh, I'll come in right up there, right to the back of the tree, like at an angle through here and expose myself as little as possible. Like I wouldn't want to come in through the edge of switchgrass where we drive through to get in here because then I'm exposing myself to movement down here. But somewhere up here where I can just drop straight down to the stand location and uh, expose myself as little as possible to the sides in the slope. more questions about this spot specifically. Okay, so in the past you've had a bunch of videos talking about using uh, hill country to use thermals to cheat the wind. Does any of that apply here since you're looking pretty far down or is a like cardinal direction bad wind, you know, back this way, would you, would you count on that swirling up or would you, is that just too much into the heart of your property? For you? It drops off really significantly just right there. You can barely see it through there. So, and it's dropping off right down here too. So I'm gonna send my scent straight from behind me so that it wraps around in my face from up high. So with, with us being towards the top of the ridge, we'll get really good lift, thermal lift coming up here in the morning. And then, uh, and that's what I was talking about. We have to use the thermals to our advantage in the morning like that. We can blow our scent up there, but in the evening, we have to make sure we have a strong enough wind so the thermals don't pull our scent down into the movement over here. Oh. And you can see with this water hole, there's an option of trails down a little bit lower. We don't want them up by us. They they go in a V right here. There's a really nice trail to the right, right over there, or you know, straight in front of me. That goes right up to the corner of the food pot up there. So we want to keep everything on this side. And so I might cut down a couple other trees just to be kind of steer them in a thoughtful approach. I don't like in this area. We don't. If it was northern Ohio and there's not a lot of cover, you can compartmentalize deer and make them have very small little travel corridors here. It's more of a thoughtful suggestion. You have a little bit of a hinge cut here. A hinge cut here just to keep it keep it growing so and any other water hole a related question yeah sure most of the water holes we've done on our farm we have a lot of problems with having like mosquito larvae and stuff like that that's always in there mm -hmm. is there any way or any treatments you've used to eliminate that issue i i haven't even worried about it okay. it seems more natural just like every water hole out in the woods will have mosquito larvae in it um, so keeping with that natural, I think they expect it's natural over there. There's mosquito larvae. It's whatever smell they like with that water hole, they can associate with this water hole too. And I think that's the same, just a little bit off to topic, but with your food plots. That's why I like all my food plots the same. You have the same combinations of green. So if they get imprinted in their head that your food plots are safe and they're not being as pressured as your neighbors, your neighbor probably doesn't have the same uh, food plot seed blends. Um, and a lot of times has them scattered around. And so I think that they get impression on noise, scent, sound, um, sight. So if they come into a nice smelling food plot that they enjoy, I mean, going to that other one in the area, I think that's a way to, to keep them calm and low stress on your property. And it's important to have all your food plots be the same anyways, or most of them. And, but uh, that's uh, another big factor is I think you're giving the, the deer a good impression that that smell is a good smell. That taste is a good taste, whatever it might be. Um, <laughs> so it's a pass through of yeah. the trails going to and from. Um, on average, like how long does a buck hang out 
That's the beauty of a water hole. The beauty of a water hole is that they're here for a minute stop, two minutes, unless it's a social thing where a big one's coming in, an older one, and he's messing with a small one. We saw that last year. But unless it's social or something taking place like that where he's spending time making a mock scrape too, it's literally a minute. And so what's the beauty of that is let's say this was a nice little hunting plot, much less risk coming into a small water hole spot where it's just a pasture as opposed to something they might stop at for 20 minutes. So your exposure getting in and out is greater to the deer. So that's, I really like that, that they can just one stop shop, they come in here and they're, and they're moving on. So really cool. Um, let's wrap this up. So I appreciate you guys watching this video and some of the input put and discussion that we have here. It's been a really worthwhile event. And if you, I, I know you obviously couldn't make it this year, but uh, hopefully you can make it next year because it's for a great cause and that's bottom line. So hopefully you enjoyed these questions and, but uh, thank you guys for watching. Folks, I wanna make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.